got your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 3. Book of Mark, chapter 3. And I want to go to verse 5. I was reading over this passage of Scripture uh, earlier this week, I think it was. um, Maybe middle of the week. In our Bible readings anyways. and, And something caught my attention as I began to read it. There's actually a couple of things in this passage of Scripture I want to look at. But we'll read this first. And the Bible said, Mark chapter 3, verse 5, And when they had, and when he, speaking of Jesus, had looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of the hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as the other. Um, this was during a time when, when Jesus, uh, the Pharisees were looking for something to do Jesus, for uh, Jesus did something wrong. And they knew that there was a man with a withered hand in the church and it would get Jesus' attention when he came to the church synagogue. And they was waiting to see if he was going to heal on the Sabbath day or not. And the Bible, something interesting that I looked at the Bible when I read it here, And when he had looked around about them with anger. Then he healed the man. I put in my notes, perhaps if we get angry with the enemy, amen, that something would change and something would happen. And when I I read this, we, we, we picture Jesus a lot of times as the tender lamb of God who's always loving and compassionate. Well, i tell you something this morning. That's what's wrong with a lot of our church world today and people that are not in church but like to talk about religion. They say Jesus is a God of love. Amen. And, he don't, and He's not a God of hate. Well, I've got news for you this morning. You can read in the Bible that God does hate things in the Bible. He is a God of love. God is love. But there is also some things that God hates. And that's what nobody wants to talk about. And when you do talk about it, they think you're judging. Amen. And they quote the scripture, judge not, without reading the whole part of the scripture. It says when you do judge, judge righteously. Amen. And and you know them by the fruits that they bear. Amen. So there is some things that God hates. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I, what's it say? Hated. So there are some things, amen, and people, because of the things they do, that God does not like. We don't like using the word hate because it's a strong word, amen. And and nowadays, there's churches, um, the the same church that you heard me talk about Wednesday night, that uh, the woman that dressed like a man got up and was preaching and saying uh, uh, that the eunuchs in the Bible were transgenders and they're all through the Bible and, and, and they twist the scripture. But that same people, I watched another video that they had called coming out. And they wasn't coming out because they were homosexuals. There was already no one. But they were coming out saying, amen, that hell is not real. And they're coming out to tell you, hell, hell is not real because God does not hate. Amen. And God's not going to send you to hell because he loves you. So there isn't a hell. So they trust the word of God because God's a God of love. And God doesn't hate. Amen. But I got news for you this morning. There are some things that God hates. Amen. And there's some things, amen, that perhaps we should get angry with. Amen. Uh, 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 because there is a thing, but sometimes it's hard to imagine Jesus being angry. But he was. Now most of us at one time or another have experienced having a, a member of our body maybe hurt or become temporarily useless, useless and, and because of an injury or something. And we've discovered, discovered how dependent we are on that certain part of the body. Um, most of you know about probably 11 years ago now, maybe 12 or something like that, I had a motorcycle wreck and I, and I crashed and I broke my wrist. I got still plates in my wrist. So I couldn't use this part of my arm. Uh, but then I landed also on this side of my leg 
and I think it was the bone below my knee here it was fractured, so I, I couldn't put weight on my leg. Most of you may remember me coming in in a wheelchair because I couldn't use crutches, because I couldn't use this arm and I couldn't use this leg. So I came in in a wheelchair, but I realized then how dependent I was on my right hand. And I realized how much I was dependent on my left leg, amen, because I couldn't use them there. And by for about four months, amen, this right arm was practically useless, amen. And I found it impossible to do some simple things like button my shirt, time is used, amen. I realized how dependent I was, amen, on my right hand. Well, this man that Mark tells us about was handicapped, amen. He was, his hand was shriver, shriveled, and he could not use it. Was he born that way? Did he have an accident? Did something happen? Amen. To call his hand to shrivel? I don't know. The Bible really doesn't go into detail about that. Amen. But it does say that for a long time he was handicapped and he had no chance of improvement or healing. But in that day, Jesus, after he was 30 years old, started his ministry and handicapped in those days had no hope. For healing, Amen. They they couldn't imagine uh, when they heard. You could imagine when they heard about Jesus and how excited they got because there was a man, Amen, that was going around and healing people of their diseases and and how quickly I'm sure that message traveled from village to village. Now here's a man that has, and uh, that that's actually healing people of diseases and people that couldn't walk they begin to walk people that can't hear begin to hear people that can't see begin to see and I'm sure people that that had these diseases and illness and and handicaps hey man they were excited because Jesus was coming to town suddenly the hopeless began to have some hope aren't you glad that's what Jesus does hey man it gives you hope in a hopeless situation hey man they begin to seek out Jesus whenever he came into the city. Amen. His popularity grew. Amen. And he became uh, somebody uh, that great crowds began to come around him and follow him everywhere. Amen. They were A lot of them were simply following him because they wanted a healing or they wanted to be fed. Amen. Or needed a physical uh, me, a need that they didn't bet. Yeah. Amen. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. But Jesus knew their deepest needs and, and he met them in a very direct way. But now we see Jesus walking into the synagogue. We saw, and when he looked around, he not only saw the man with the withered hand, but he saw the Pharisees, the group of Pharisees, as they were watching him, waiting for an opportunity, amen, to get Jesus, say, I got you. Amen. And, and they, they were ready to condemn him because they knew the heart of Jesus and they knew that he was going to heal on the Sabbath day because he had compassion on people. Jesus looked at the Pharisees, the scripture before this, Jesus looked at the script, the Pharisees, and he asked them a very direct question. He says, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to kill, uh, to save a life or to kill? And the Pharisees knew the answer to this, but they said, did not say a word. They'd say nothing about it. And Jesus knew their hearts here in verse 5. And the man, and he looked around with anger. Jesus was angry with them. He was deeply distressed because of their stubborn hearts. Amen. He knew they weren't concerned about the man's shriveled hand. And Jesus said this. He said, stretch forth your hand. They didn't say anything because they knew whatever they said was going to be wrong, amen. But they was looking for something wrong that Jesus was doing so they could condemn him, amen. He stretched forth his hand, amen. And, and, and I like this because the handicapped man now was made whole, amen. The hand now that couldn't do anything, now he could button buttons, he could tie shoes and do all the things that you and I, amen, take for granted for doing, amen, without taking a second thought. But now this man was greatly rejoicing because he had gotten a touch from Jesus, amen. But the Pharisees wasn't happy about it, amen. They got angry at Jesus, Amen. And, he, and, they, and the Bible says because he healed on the Sabbath day, it was against what they said was the law. Amen. On the Sabbath day. And you can probably see the fiery darts going between 
the, far, uh, the Pharisees and Jesus, amen. And Jesus, the Pharisees were angry, but so was Jesus, amen. It's easy to accept knowing the Pharisees were angry, but sometimes it's hard to accept knowing that Jesus actually got angry. That's something, amen. Again, we picture Jesus as the tender lamb of God and, hard to, and, and he's always loving and compassionate. It's hard to imagine Jesus being angry. That's what I want to talk about for a few minutes of this morning. And I believe the reason we see it, I think it's difficult to see Jesus being angry because most of the time when we think of people being angry, it's associated with immaturity and not being mature because they can't control their temper. Amen. And, and, and I'm sure we've, we've all been tempted to be angry. Uh, and, and anger is, is something you don't have to be learned. You don't have to learn to be angry. Something we're born with. If you go to a nursery where a bunch of babies are, take the bottle from them, don't change the diaper, guess what? That baby gets angry. Amen. He begins to cry, or, amen, and, 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 until something's done because he gets angry. It's some, not something we have to learn, amen, but it's something we, uh, that we need to control in our lives. Um, anybody can be angry. Old people can be angry, young people can be angry, rich people can be angry, poor people can be angry, amen, and, and, and all of us have the capability of becoming angry. But the book of Psalms says this, it says we are told to flee from anger. That's what the psalmist wrote. And then Paul wrote something that seemed to con contradict that. He said, that Paul wrote this, he said, be angry, but sin not. So there's sometimes we got to flee anger. Sometimes it's okay to be angry, but don't sin when you are angry. And what I believe what Paul's saying here, we need to be very be careful when it begins to warn us, because if we do get angry, it can be very easily to sin when we do get angry. So we need to be very careful. You know, you know I know that this is true when... Uh, when we're angry, our emotions are on edge. You ever notice that? And we're vulnerable to being tempted to do something that we wouldn't normally do. When we say, we begin to say things that we normally wouldn't say if we're angry. And we begin to do things that we wouldn't normally do when we get angry. Amen. Can anybody say amen with me? Amen. But Paul wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, speaking of love, he said, love is not easily angered. Amen. So real love in our hearts, amen. We need to control our anger. But we'll look at here in just a minute. Paul writes in the book of Ti to Titus, and one of the qualifications of being an elder, an elder should not be hot-tempered. It's one of the qualifications of being an elder or a leader in the church. Amen. Paul teaches us that if we're going to be a spiritual leader, you can't return anger for anger. Amen. You've got to be able to control yourself and control your spirit. You can't have explosion uh, times, amen, when you just explode. You need to control our spirit. Now, we have Christians, we all are tempted to honk our horn and shake our fist at somebody when they do something and cuts us off. Amen. Sometimes we're tempted, amen, but we, we are, we've gotten angry, amen. But if we as Christians, we follow Jesus, we held our peace, amen. We said a prayer and kept on going our happy way, right? We don't throw the hamburger at nobody. We don't hit our head on the window because they can't get the window down fast enough to yell at somebody, <laughs> Right? Amen, and, and uh, years ago, a few weeks after me and Becky got married, I'm going to tell them myself this morning, and uh, it's just a couple of weeks after me and Becky got married, I was in town, I was traveling to Brother Hall, and I came back, it was uh, maybe on Sunday or Monday, because that's when we was in town, and I, we, me and Becky was driving down the road in my little black Mustang, and a uh, uh, young boy I don't know what happened. He went by. He was mad about something, and he gave me the finger when he went by me. I just, it just got me. 
I was guess I was having a bad day. Came up to the stoplight. I took my Mustang, pulled out in front of the car so he couldn't go out anywhere. Got out of my Mustang and went back there and slapped that boy in the face and told him, if you ever stick that finger up in me again, I'm going to break it off. I don't know what happened. We've all done it. Well, maybe you all haven't done it. Maybe you've done better than I have. Amen. I got back in the car. Becky didn't say a word. <laughs> she said, what did I marry? <laughs> Two weeks after. But we all have uh, uh, things, amen, that we have to repent for because we've gotten angry. And, and those things, if we've done that, hopefully we've asked God to forgive us because that was the wrong type of anger. And we get angry at things. Amen. But the Bible discourages us to be angry in that way. Anger usually keeps us uh, um, in the wrong side of, of what God wants. And I want to look at it just for a few minutes this morning. I want to look at the anger of the Pharisees and, and how it was different than the anger that Jesus had. First of all, their anger was sought to become, and they was, it was a selfish anger because they was thinking about themselves. They wasn't concerned about the man with the withered hand. Amen. They, they could care less whether he was healed or whether he wasn't healed. Amen. They, they was only concerned about the law and their traditions because if the law and traditions was broken, then it made them look bad. So they were selfish and they got angry because Jesus was making them look bad and they were angry about it. Another thing, one way we can know if our anger is wrong, if we are tempted to do harm to another person because we're angry, that's the wrong kind of anger. So we need to control our anger. They, 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 the rulers and the, they, the traditions were in question. Amen. They didn't care about the handicapped man. Amen. And, 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 and they were concerned only about themselves. Have we ever been there? Amen. I'm sure we have. Amen. But we read about people being prosecuted, and it really doesn't make any difference to us unless we're the ones being prosecuted. Amen. We hear about people being discriminated against, and it really doesn't make any difference unless we're the ones being discriminated against. Amen. And, and then we become angry. But when Jonah preached to Nineveh, God told him to go to Nineveh and preach. Amen. They tell him, uh, preach for 40 days. And he, that he did. Amen. He preached a uh, uh, house down. Amen. He preached that if you do not repent, amen, God's going to destroy your land. Amen. And he preached it just like God told him to do. And then God, he preached so good that they repented of their sins. And God said, I'm not going to destroy Nineveh. What did, what did Jonah do? Did he rejoice because God decided he wasn't going to destroy the land? No, he got angry. Jonah did. He got angry and he was uh, because God was being merciful. And Jonah didn't rejoice because the people were saved and the city was spared, but he became angry because his reputation as a prophet was now at hand. Amen. He said, I would prophesy and told him God was going to destroy the land and now you're not going to do it. Amen. And he was selfish about it. It was the wrong kind of anger. When the Pharisees became angry at Jesus, amen, they desired to hurt him because they began to conspire with the other leaders and the, uh, 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 to know how they're going to destroy Jesus. They wanted to hurt him. That was what their anger was doing. And sometimes we want to do that, don't we? We get angry at somebody and, and we want to get them back. Amen. We want to hurt them. Amen. Well, that's the wrong kind of anger to have. When you want to hurt somebody, that's when it becomes a sin. That's what Paul was talking about. Be angry, but sin not. Sometimes we want to physically hurt the person. Amen. And when we don't physically hurt the person, we'll use our tongue. Amen. And talk about them and try to hurt them in a different way. Amen. We'll say, well, if we can't hurt them with, by talking about them, we'll just say, well, I just won't be their friend and I'll hurt them that way. It's like the older brother did, amen, when the prodigal son came back, amen, he got angry. He said, well, I just won't even go to the banquet then. Like, like him not going to the banquet was going to hurt everybody's feelings, amen. But what it does sometimes, it actually hurts us, the one that's been angry, more than it does the person that we're angry with. Doctors, amen, have talked about people that have been angry, how it affects their health. 
Amen. Because they want to get angry and hurt somebody or talk about somebody. And actually what it's doing, it's hurting us more than it's hurting them. The problem is we want to get even. Amen. And usually uh, we want to hurt somebody, but try to hurt somebody and get even with them. And this is what the Pharisees did. They were, their anger was selfish and, and their anger was to reach out and to hurt somebody, to hurt Jesus. It was the source of their anger. But when Jesus got angry, it was a little bit different. When Jesus got angry, he did not sin. There was no sin in him. It was a spotless lamb, but he got angry. But it was right when he got angry. Jesus was, uh, he was angry, but not because of his own selfish reasons, but it, the motive behind why he got angry was because of the hardness of the hearts. They had no compassion for those that were handicapped. They had no compassion for the hurt. They had no compassion, amen, for the man with the withered hand. They didn't care about him. They just they wanted their own thing, amen. His, his, uh, his anger was not selfish. His anger was because what they, what was it because of what they had personally done to him or what they was wanting to do to him. Amen. If you study the life of Jesus, he never became angry because of something people did to him. Although there was a lot of opportunities where he could have got angry. Amen. One night Jesus was invited to the home of, the, of a Pharisee and it seemed like everything was going good. Amen. And pleasant in the dinner, but all of a sudden, amen, they began to deliberately embarrass and ridicule him. He could have got angry at that time. And I'm sure he did get hurt. Amen. But he did not become angry because somebody was trying to hurt him. In the upper room, Peter said, Lord, I'll go with you. I'll never leave you. Amen. I'll, I'll even go to, to death with you. But just a few hours after that, we see Jesus cursing, saying, I don't know who he is. Jesus knew this, and it sure it hurt him. He could have got angry at that time at Peter, but he didn't. He didn't get angry at Peter. When he was oh, hanging on the cross and they were shouting at him and said, if you're really the Son of God, come off the cross. And, and I'm sure he looked and many of those people that he had touched and he had helped and he had healed was shouting those words. I'm sure it hurt him. And there was an opportunity that he could have got angry, but he didn't get angry. You can read through the life of Jesus. He never got angry because of something people was trying to do to him. Amen. When he saw the... Uh, uh, the right being trampled on underneath the feet, he could have got angry, but he didn't. When he saw the law of God being dishonored, he could have got angry, but he didn't. When he saw the house of God being yeah. yeah. uh, turned into thieves, he did become angry at that time. But not at the people, but because of the hearts. I mean, he became angry at the right things. Amen. It was important to realize, amen, when we get angry, we got to be getting angry for the right things. Amen. And direct them to the right things and not try to harm somebody or hurt somebody or get somebody told or tell them how it is. Amen. I wonder if Jesus looked at our modern church today. I wonder what kind of emotion he would have. Maybe would it be filled with joy? Would it be filled with anger? I believe. Amen. He would be angry with some of the things that's going on in our churches today. I believe when their churches are not concerned what the Word of God really says. I believe he's kind of angry about it. When the church has preached that homosexuality is okay, I believe he's angry about it. And when I talked about, amen, the church is preaching God is love and that he doesn't hate anything, I believe he gets a little bit angry about it. When church leaders live in sin, amen, and now we're starting to see them exposed, amen, because of the things that they've done, or doing. And I believe, I believe this is just the beginning of it. There's some, the Bible says judgment must first what? Begin in the house of the Lord. And, and you can see right now, I, I don't know what's happening in Texas, but there was just three or four pastors in Texas. Amen. Being exposed in, their, in different places. I've seen in North Carolina. In different places, people are being exposed. As a matter of fact, a church that I preached at, 
Amen. Uh, man, Becky's preached out there. Uh, the, 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 I talked to the wife and the, the husband came out, said he's a homosexual. Amen. And he fell in love with a man. Amen. And he left his wife. And I know we know them personally, amen, down in uh, Virginia. And, and he left his wife, amen, took all the money out of the bank account, uh, took the car, and left it with nothing. People's being exposed for what they're hiding. Amen. Judgment must first begin in the house. You can't go to a rap singer named Diddy, amen, being a pastor of church and thinking it's okay. Amen. And, and, it, and it's been done, Amen. Uh, and I ain't going to mention no names. If you, all you have to do is look it up. Amen. I believe God's angry and he's starting to expose some of their sins. Amen. It's just the beginning too, I believe. I believe he's angry at the church when it goes through the mechanics of just being a Christian and not being really a, a true Christian. How many people do we work with? They say, yes, I'm a Christian, but then you hear them cussing and you hear them uh, doing all kinds of dirty things and, and out in the bars on the weekends but going to church on Sundays so they think they're okay, amen. I, don't, I believe God's angry, amen, when the church has lost uh, caring for the lost and reaching for the lost, amen. They forgot about the Holy Spirit and, and trying to what's, what God is trying to do in their lives. And instead, of they have men's conferences, Amen. In the men's conference, they start off with monster trucks. Amen. Going through. And, uh, and what that has to do with the men's conference and God, I don't know. But then right after that, they have a man dancing, climbing a pole, taking his shirt off in a men's conference. I believe God's angry with it. I believe he's angry, amen, because of different things that's going on in, in churches. And, I, and they forgot the real reason for their existence. Amen. Of simply going through the emotions of being religious. I believe he's angry. But when we get angry, we need to have the right kind of anger. Uh, listen to this morning. Anger brings energy. And we all know that. Have you ever, have you ever got angry for something and just had a boost of energy? You, yeah, you have. You, you've got angry at somebody and, and you know you've got a boost of energy because you can stay up half the night thinking about how you're going to get even with them. Amen. How many's done it? Amen. It, it's, it, it, it affects our emotions and it gives us energy. But if we can take that same anger, that same energy, and do something for God, steer it to the right thing, amen, we can turn the world upside down. I wonder how the apostles and the disciples, amen, how they turned the world upside down because there was a type of anger that they got what the enemy was doing. Amen. They, they took that energy and used it for the right. So when we get angry, get angry at the right things for the right reason. Amen. We become a mighty army of God when we can change the world once again and when our anger is pointed at the right thing. If we can avoid being angry at one another. The devil wants you to strive, put strife between church members. Matter of fact, one of the things that God hates, says man, is he that soweth discord. Among the brethren, you can read it, amen. And that's what Satan to do. He'll bring anger in and try to make you angry with the person across the hallway or the person sitting in front of you. Try to get you to be angry with that person, amen, and, and not talk to them and not deal with them and not say nothing to them, amen. Well, that's the devil doing that and not God, amen. If you get angry, be angry at the right thing and not the, right, not the wrong person. Jesus got angry, amen, but he, didn't get, he got angry for the right things. Mark is, is the one that brought this out. He visibly saw the expression of Jesus and saw Jesus' eyes when he looked around with anger in his eyes. And I'm sure we've all seen that look from our parents, or you as a parent has given that look. All you have to do is give them that look. They know you, they better be quiet. Amen. That's probably the same type of look Jesus gave. Amen. And, and, and here Mark was an uh, eyewitness. Amen. He saw, amen, what Jesus had did. But he saw them, he saw him be angry without sin. Be angry and sin not. Now, another thing I like about this passage of Scripture, <clears throat> as soon as he entered into the synagogue, there was one man that got his attention. It was the one with the withered hand. Which goes to show us, amen, Jesus is concerned about the hurting. 
Jesus is concerned about those that need a, that are sick and need a touch from God. Yeah. Jesus is concerned when he comes in. Amen. Jesus is concerned about that one that is hurting and needs a touch from God. The Pharisees' minds went automatically went to Jesus. Amen. They didn't care about the man. They didn't care about what was going on in his life. And they, they, they looked for something to get Jesus on. Amen. This was the true nature of Jesus. When he came in, though, he didn't look to see how everybody else was dressed. He didn't look to see what kind of chariot they came up in. He wasn't looking at the horses. I mean, he wasn't looking at the decor or anything else. He saw that one that needed a touch from him. Jesus came, amen, for you. Sometimes when people come into church, they may look at somebody and think, man, that family or that person's got it made. Amen. Nothing goes wrong with them. God's really blessed them. Amen. And they think a withered hand, nothing. My whole life's been messed up. I've been crippled in my flesh. I've been withered hand. Amen. It was nothing compared to my disaster in my whole life. But that's who Jesus came for. Amen. Jesus came for you. He's interested in your needs. And he's interested in what you need most. The Bible says they watched as he would begin to heal on the Sabbath day. And according to their interpretation, it was wrong to do that. According to the, the, the heal on the Sabbath, amen. Because according to their interpretation, it was unlawful for them to do that. Amen. They, according to them, they could only preserve life and not do nothing toward a healing of life. But Jesus was angry at this. He looked around about them with anger. Amen. Because it hurt his heart. Because he saw their hearts. Amen. But Jesus, he looked at that man with an withered hand. Amen. And seeing he needed something. And Jesus said this, stretch forth your hand. This morning, I believe Jesus is saying, stretch forth your hand to some of us. You see, Jesus asked him to do the impossible. I'm sure he had tried it thousands and hundreds of times to stretch forth his hand, but he couldn't do it. It was withered. Jesus asked him to do the impossible. You, you say you're, you're, uh, you ever feel like God has asked you to do the impossible before? If God's asked you to do something, it's not impossible. Amen. All things are possible to him that believeth in God. Amen. He stood there with his withered hand. He said, I'm sure he's tried it thousands of times. Amen. The withered man had two choices. He could have argued with God. And say, but God, you don't understand. I've been this way for, for a long time. And I, I, my hand's withered. And I can't do that. Amen. Uh, and, and he could have sat there and, and said, Lord, don't you know the condition that I'm in? And could have gave him a thousand excuses why he couldn't do it. Like we do many times. Amen. But he obeyed God. He obeyed the command that God gave him. I believe his mind said he can't. But his heart said I want to do what God told me to do. And he stretched for the sand. Amen. And he obeyed God. And he was able to do that. That was impossible before. Because he listened to Jesus. Interesting thing about the crippled area in your life. Jesus is concerned about it. Jesus is interested in those crippled areas in your life. Maybe there's habits, amen, in your flesh that defeats you. There's situations that you just can't seem to get the victory. There's a place of weakness in your life, amen. Jesus is concerned about those areas. And I believe Jesus is saying, stretch forth your hand. But say, Lord, I've tried it a hundred of times. I believe Jesus is saying, be delivered now. Jesus is saying, have complete victory. Jesus is saying, be free, amen, and be free now. You don't have to struggle when you say what I've done many times. I've, I, I've tried to do it, amen, and I've, had a, a, and I've couldn't do it before. Amen. We can argue with Jesus all we want, but if we just simply obey God, said, okay, God, I'll do the impossible. Amen. I'll do what you asked me to do, and I'll, I'll be set free. I'll be delivered. I believe that moment his heart began to obey God. Amen. He said, okay, God, I'll do what you say even though I've tried a thousand times before and I couldn't do it, I'll do it now because Jesus said I can. Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. It was a command that was impossible. Amen. To that which I haven't been able to do before, I'm going to do with God's help. That that I couldn't overcome before, I'm going to overcome now with God's help. 
those things, amen, that held me back before. I'm going to be an overcomer over those things, amen, because Jesus is with me, amen. And I've tried many times, but now I'm going to dare to believe. I'm going to dare to believe. Becky sings that song, Dare to Believe. I'm going to set my past failures in the back, Amen. Those things are going to be behind me, and I'm going to run this race, amen, that God set before me, because God said I could. Amen. I'm going to do it. The, the Bible said that his hand was restored as the other. And his hand was restored as the other. Amen. When we dare to believe and obey God, amen, what we do, I believe we'll discover things that was impossible before now becomes possible because we believed in God. But notice Jesus did not ask the man, what about your good hand? Amen. He didn't say, well, well what can you do with your good, good hand? No, he immediately went to the problem that the man had, the area of weakness, his failure. Amen. And, and he, Jesus came to make the crooked path straight. He turned the beauty for ashes. One man wrote this, and I liked it. He, he's come to, to give you abilities for disabilities. I like that. Amen. Abilities for disabilities. Amen. He can speak to you now. Be strong. Amen. Give up and follow me. Amen. Stretch forth your hand. Open your eyes and you will see. Dare to believe. So there's two things we see in this passage this morning. One is we can be angry, but don't sin. Be angry at evil and the hardness of people's hearts. Just as Jesus did. Not like the Pharisees that wanted to hurt somebody from their anger. So we don't throw the hamburger. We don't slap the kid. We don't roll the window down and, and yell at somebody. Amen. If we do those, repent of those things, of those anger, because of the wrong kind of anger. Amen. Jesus gave the, his attention to the one with the withered hand. Jesus gives the attention to those weakness areas in our lives. Amen. Jesus says, stretch forth your hand. Do the impossible. Amen. Believe on him, and you can do all things. He that believeth on me. Though he were dead, amen, yet shall live. So lift your hands up this morning and say, God, let my anger be righteous anger. Amen, and let me be a conqueror and an overcomer in Jesus' name. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same. You came here. From the everlasting to the world we live, oh, the Father's only Son. Yes, you live and you die. You rose again on high. You opened the Yes. Almighty, 